All right, joined now by Brad Roland. He's the host of Locked On Hawks. Thank you so much for hopping on, man. Let's talk Atlanta. Let's talk Hawks. We had some expectations for this team in the offseason to kind of improve upon the 500 or so record that they've been around. And now we're sitting here at 9 and 10. Uh, things have not been going as well of late. Started the year, kind of, there's a four game win streak in there. Things felt pretty good at the beginning of the year. But they're 5 and 8 in the last 13 games. What happened? Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, unfortunately, if you're a Hawks fan, familiar in a lot of ways, it feels like it's kind of felt the last couple of years. And I think that's it's too early to panic um, for one thing. But um, it's the defensive end of the floor, which is not not a secret. Um, there are a few teams in the league like this right now where they're kind of just all offense, no defense teams. And the Hawks have been on the kind of the wrong side of that right now where um, they've lost some close games. They're, you know, their underlying metrics are better than the record, I think, at this moment in time. But at the same time, I think everyone, including the people inside the building over there, would agree they can't be this bad defensively and reach their goals, basically, is what it comes down to. Offensively, they've been good and totally fine and all that. But um, the other end of the floor, it's the uh, usual problem, and it's not going very well. 9-10 and 10 record, uh, third in offensive rating on cleaning the glass, 25th in defensive rating. 14th in net rating yields kind of about average, and it's about where you would expect for a team that's, that's kind of hovered around 500 here. Uh, the thing that I was so interested when when we spoke in the offseason, just like right before the year, the trade DeJounte pairing, uh, because that's where you want your best players to shine. You want your best players to shine together. Just looked it up again right before we started. Minus 23 in, a, in 410 minutes. Uh, that's just not good enough. And it just it's, it's never going to be good enough for the Hawks if they want those two guys to be the focal points. Are these the same issues as they've faced in previous years or are they different issues? Um, I would say similar issues. You know, they, they've still been above average on offense with those guys playing, um, and that's what you would expect in some ways. But they haven't fixed the defense. You know, I'm not I'm not putting it all on Murray by any by any means. But you know, one of the theories of the Murray addition was that he was going to help fix their defense, and that that that, that has not happened to this point. Um, so that's really the area where you know you're playing with the starters most of the time when they're playing together because they, they they stagger these guys the entire game. One of them's always on the court all, all the time, so. They, they don't they don't play that many minutes together. It's about, you know, 20 ish per game like you just laid out. And that's a lot of minutes, but it's not, you know, it's less than half the game. And they, they do need to kind of um, fine tune that pairing. Um, and I think with with Quinn Snyder at the helm, they've played off each other more and more effectively, I would say, off, offensively. It's a little bit less your turn, my turn, which I think is a good thing. But the fundamental issues are still the same. I do think, though, you know, the the way that they interact and the way they play together is pretty far down the list of things I'm actually worried about on this team right now. But at the same time, to the point of the question, they kind of have to be awesome when they play together, and they haven't been. So it's like it's like w w which do you choose to focus on? Should they should they be better with the, with those two guys on the court? I would say yes. But also, like as far as like why they're not winning more games right now, I don't know how high that is in the list of, uh, of problems. No, and that's completely fair. And when you do such a stark stagger as what the Hawks do, you, you want to make sure that those individual lineups where only one of those guys are on the floor is always good too. So like if, if we just laid it out, like you said, 20 minutes per game where they're playing together means there's 28 minutes per game where they're not. So I can understand that. What what combinations have you liked in those other minutes then? Yeah, I mean, the, the the trick right now with the Hawks is that, you know, it's interesting because I feel like I'm sure you hear this from people that cover teams, um, teams that are you know, young players get a lot of attention positively and negatively. Right. And I think probably the number one positive story of this team in the early going was, was the was the development of Jalen Johnson, who was kind of having a breakout season. Mm. Right. And uh, I, I was excited about that. I think it's still very appealing. But right now he's hurt. And without him. It's a little bit of small sample size theater, but they've 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 not been the same team without Jalen Johnson on defense in particular. Um, so that's a, that's one of the questions. But I, I do think that if you look at the numbers with you know with Trey and Jalen, or you know, there's some combinations that have worked pretty well. I think Jalen Johnson, not to put too much on him, I'm mindful of not doing that. And uh, but I think that he unlocks a lot of things for them on both ends of the floor. Like he's the one guy on their forward line that's a really good passer, for instance, on offense. And then defensively, he's their best rebounding forward by a huge margin their best transition player. Um, he has flaws too, but um, it, it's, it's crazy how much they've seemed to miss him for a guy that while I was high on him, was not like widely nationally projected to be a top three or four player on this team. 
he's been the third best player this year pretty easily. So it's like, it's, it's a pretty interesting combination of things to talk about when he's going to be out for a couple more weeks and they're kind of playing triage about him. You know, it's funny when I was looking at his numbers and I was looking at kind of the profile of a guy like that, he's in his age 22 season kind of reminds me of Michael Porter Jr. in Denver. They're obviously distinctly different players, but young guys that putting up these massively efficient numbers, these massively efficient stats at that forward spot and I, kind of were initially seen as superfluous or as a role player, but then kind of grow into that particular role. Uh, I think he's been great. Like he, he's he been awesome. And it's been one of those fun storylines to see just looking at the numbers here, 14 points, seven rebounds, two assists, one steal, one block. That's great. That's an awesome number that you get to look forward to. And we, when we projected their starting lineup at the beginning of the year, we didn't have him in there. Like I, I think it was Sadiq Bey who we thought was going to be in that spot. Uh, just how has the, the forward pairings kind of, played out, whether it's with Jalen Johnson and Sadiq Bey, just kind of now that John Collins is not there, he was a mainstay for so long. Yeah, it's interesting because it actually was Sadiq Bey to open the season. They, mm-hmm. they opened the season with Sadiq at the, as a starter, which I kind of thought was going to happen, and it did. But Jalen kind of just forced his way on the court. I mean, he was he was notably good right out of the gate, and um, the pairing has kind of worked better with him on the court. You know, Bay's defense has been a problem area. Um, he's not alone by any means, but they're having some trouble when they're playing, especially without Jalen Johnson and having Bay at the four um, alongside their backcourt problems defensively, not only just Trey and DeJounte, but Bogdanovich. And they have a lot of poor defenders on the perimeter. Um, DeAndre Hunter has been kind of the fixture. He's kind of been DeAndre Hunter, which is not the worst thing in the world by any means. He's a starting quality forward in the league but he's not a guy that's going to be he's not a top 50 player you know what i mean he's not yeah. he's not breaking out this is this is year five um he's kind of he, he kind of is what he is at this stage which is fine but he isn't a he's not he's not a difference maker so without without johnson in particular they don't have a lot of juice on the forward line it's very it's very apparent to me on offense and defense especially defense um and while they have quality center play they, they just need generally more from the forwards i think i've been saying this on all of my podcast appearances and other things like the last two months the forward line was going to dictate this season this season for the hawks and i think one of the reasons why they are where they are right now as a 500 ish team is that the forward line has kind of been outside of johnson's breakout and of course he's hurt right now has been pretty underwhelming hunter's just been kind of the same guy bay's kind of struggled and uh you know aj griffin's barely playing in his second season like they have they don't have a lot going on at those spots let's let's push on that a little bit because aj griffin was one of those guys that especially watching him last year he looks so comfortable he looks so capable in in those minutes and like a a guy who was a a scorer wise above his years in, in a lot of ways uh, what's going on? Like, what, I'm seeing 11 games, no starts, nine minutes per game. Yeah, it's the 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 no, the no starts is not a surprise. You know, they, other than Johnson, they've been pretty healthy, sure. but um, it's a combination of he was kind of the ninth guy coming into the season, and Snyder likes to play short rotations. He likes to play. He's been playing eight man rotations for full halves, like on a regular basis this season. I don't know if that's hmm. you know going to always happen, but he was kind of coming into the year kind of on the fringe. And then when they now have Wes Matthews, they've kind of gone the veteran route there, a more boring defense first veteran, I think in part to kind of triage the defense because they've had so many issues there. And AJ Griffin is struggling defensively as a lot of guys do, but um, second year guy. And he's again, not, not alone by any means, but he's not a, he's not going to help you there right now. And he's not playing with a ton, with, with a ton of confidence. I don't think, you know, it, it's too early of a sample size. You talk, he's not played that much for me to like be worried about him necessarily, but he feels like he's kind of sped up, you know, he might be the only guy, maybe Clint Capella be the other one uh, on this roster that might've been a little bit cleaner fit under the previous regime that played a little bit slower. AJ is a pretty methodical guy. He's kind of, um, and for me, it's a positive thing. He's pretty, he's pretty even keel. He doesn't really get too high, too low. He's kind of playing at his own speed, but right now the Hawks are trying to play fast and they're trying to move quickly and make, make quick decisions. That's not, that's not really what he does. So it's a combination of, you know, they have, they have some decent depth, they also are not prioritizing just like playing him just to play him. Like I think they're trying to win games right now. And also he's just not playing that well when he plays. It's it's small it's small it's small stints, like three, four minutes. But if he doesn't make shots, he doesn't he's not really giving you a lot. So that that's kind of the longish version. But it's uh I wish he was playing more often often if it was me, if I'm if it was me in charge, um I would given this team this, this team not not gonna be a contender this year anyway, I would prioritize to just kind of get him out there more consistently. That'd be what I would be trying to do. But I do understand not because he, he's not played that well. And their biggest problem is defense. and he, he just can't help there. Yeah, it's just hard for me to really put that on him as a as a young player. You're oh, not no. really expecting yeah. that from him. 
you should expect that from your veterans. You should ex- expect that from your starters. And the fact that they haven't been able to defend even without him, that's that's not exactly a great sign either. So that's that's a, that's something to watch. That's something that I'm, I will be checking in with you in a couple of weeks or six weeks later now. Um, is there any like is there any reason to believe right now that the Hawks are going to be more than an average? What, what are the what are the threads that we can kind of pull on that say, hey, they're underperforming in this thing that will definitely benefit them later? Yeah, I think in general, they're underperforming their point differential. If you, I mean, you mentioned playing the glass earlier, some of the more advanced numbers, your, your, um, the adjusted net ratings, like they're still kind of in the positive, but it's more like the plus one. You yeah. know what I mean? Maybe they should, maybe, maybe they should be 10 and nine instead of nine and 10 kind of thing. Yeah. It's not like they've like wildly underperformed, maybe a game or two. Um, I do think the defense is going to be, this is risky to say, better than it, better than it's been so far. Now, are they going to be good defensively? Almost definitively not. Like they don't have great personnel. I've ranted on this for many, many months and months and months other places. If you go up, up and down the line on this roster right now, outside of the center position, they don't have really many guys that I would describe as even average defensive players. And that will catch up to you. Like when you're, you're kind of Jalen Johnson is the only, is the outlier in terms of like size and burst. But so if, if he's not there, it's even more magnified, but put him to the side and you have all these guys who are either small or just slow footed or whatever. And it's like, eh. so I, I do think that the offense is legitimate and that's legitimately a top five ish unit in the league. And that's a great baseline to have. If you can keep that offense at the top five level and just be 20th on defense instead of 25th or 26th, that's, that, that's the path. I think like opponent shooting wise, they've been pretty, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to call it unlucky, but you know, I think they're 28th in opponent shooting right now. Right. I don't know if that's going to continue to be that bad. Um, if it does, then that's doomsday. You can't, you, you just can't live with that number given the way that they're playing. They're playing a different scheme, which we'll save for another time. It's a much more aggressive. They're playing at the level more with their bigs, et cetera. Um, I think they might at some point kind of go back to what they used to do, play a little bit more conservatively. Hmm. Um, that's maybe one pathway. I'm not saying that that's a, that, that, that's not going to fix it, but um, if you're trying to triage, that might be a way to kind of minimize some of the mistakes they're making, et cetera. So, I think the the that's the long version of I, I think the offense is legitimate, which is a, a nice building block, top five unit, and then there's just like maybe incremental gains to be ha- had on defense, which might push you to the in the mid forties and wins. It's not going to get you to fifty wins. It's just with what I, with what I've seen so far, barring a Jalen Johnson continued breakout as he comes back, there is not that you know other than trades, there's not really that thing to make them you know hugely better. It's just that you have to defend you know incrementally better and uh, sort of nudge your way back into uh, respectability there. Yeah, when you say more aggressive defensive scheme it doesn't really line up with me for Clint Capella I can understand it with Okongwu like he's, yeah. he's a guy that makes a lot of sense he's six foot eight I think and a little bit shorter but definitely somebody who switches out onto the perimeter I think a little bit more adequately especially with Capella kind of aging out a little bit in terms of his physical prime um, so that's that's interesting that that might be kind of a sign of things to come maybe in in, in the next six weeks or so uh very fascinating yeah. um all right <laughs> let's uh let's wrap up with this at what point do the Hawks start targeting upgrades? We've heard their their interest uh, uh, kind of through the grapevine of Pascal Siakam before, but uh, is he a guy that they're they're looking at, or is this something where they just have to wait how these next kind of six weeks look? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. They're definitely in on Siakam. They have been for a long time. I know it kind of got rekindled, but it kind of never went away. Is my what I would tell you is like. Unless it's a, it's a hardened situation where there's an active trade request, you guys don't really get traded in October and November. Sure. You know what I mean? Like it, it, once camp starts, it kind of just quiets. Um, but I think that the Hawks were always in on Siakam this summer. They just kind of didn't meet. They, they did not want to meet the price that Toronto was asking because they, they were asking for the sun, the moon, and the stars. And I understand why they didn't why they didn't meet that price. If, the, if that price gets lowered, I could certainly see the Hawks getting staying in and maybe being the team that gets Pascal in the next few months. But even then that's probably, that's probably more of a late January, February kind of deal. Like mo- most of the time you don't see a ton of action in December. Um, occasionally you will, but um, I think the ultimate answer to your question about like when we see or how aggressive they are in trades is like, where are they in the standings? It's a lot easier to sell a buy move an aggressive adding to your team move. If you are the six seed, if versus if you're the if, if you're the ten seed, you know what I mean. Sure. And that may, that, may, that may not be a huge difference, but do they want to keep throwing? The way I was, this is going to sound more negative than I mean it, but do you want to keep throwing good money after bad? 
You know what I mean? They've kind of already pushed a, not all in, but they they're they're in. They're, they're trying to win now. They they went and paid a lot for Dejounte and, and trade capital. They traded five picks for Sadiq Bay. Like they're trying to win actively right now. Do they want to leverage more future capital to improve? Because they don't really. I mean, maybe maybe AJ Griffin will be the only only guy on the roster. Maybe Kobe Bufkin, who's also been banged up right now, their first round pick. They have a couple of guys on their team that are like kind of the equivalent of draft pick in- inclusions, like sweeteners. But usually it's draft picks and young guys. And do they want to keep going down that road for a team that, yeah, maybe if it's a, a Siakam level player, that's a big enough upgrade where it's like maybe you just, maybe you can justify it. But do you want to trade a first round pick for a role player? Maybe not on this team with, with where you are. That kind of thing, you know. No, of course, and it's all about kind of where you are in your journey, and if if you can see the light at the end of the tunnel for a championship or or high level playoffs, then obviously you want to get aggressive in those situations and really capitalize on that moment. But uh, until we see them kind of break this mold of looking like a 500 team for the most part, then I, I can understand being a little bit hesitant as well. So we will see what happens. He is Brad Roland of Locked on Hawks. Brad, thank you so much for joining me, man. Really appreciate you taking the time. Let's talk in six weeks, all right? Absolutely. Happy to do it as always. 